everyone, welcome back to the orthopedic tutor channel. Today we'll be discussing the second part of this spine tuberculosis video which regards the additional examination needed in diagnosing it, the management plan, more on this, and also regarding the atypical type of spinal tuberculosis. Let's start with the first section of this video which includes the additional examination being done. Well, we have discussed about the pathophysiology that shows that spine tuberculosis usually comes from the lung. Only around 66% have abnormal x-ray around the chest. While on the spine radiograph, you can find different findings based on different level of infection. While on the early infection, we have discussed that usually the dispersed disc space is spare and the vertebrae is involved anteriorly. And this helps us differentiate it from a pyogenic infection in which the disc space is initially invaded. While the late infection may be very similar to pyogenic where the disc space is completely destroyed. And you could also see lucency and compression of vertebral bodies with severe kyphosis. This image here shows as a collapse of the anterior section of the vertebral body along with destruction of the disc space that is around here. And you could see here is a kyphotic deformity. Now, the other thing about spine radiograph is that you need to look at spine at risk signs, which means that the spine has a higher risk of developing a buckling collapse, as you could see in the Rajasekaran classification type 3C. Now, for the spine at risk signs, which includes the toppling of the vertebrae body, subluxation, any evidence of retropulsion and also lateral translation. So when you see these signs, the spine is highly uh, risky and the buckling collapse could develop. Now for the MRI contrast, what you could do here is you could detect the abscess that forms in the spine, the abscess that forms usually has, has a, a septated. You could find it in the prevertebral region. You could also find it in the paravertebral region. This one shows the prevertebral region here at the cervical region. This is a very huge abscess. You could see it here pushing the, the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. It could also be the one type that is forming around the paravertebral region and it could also be intraosseous or within the bone substance as we could see here, the collection of pus around the bone. Now, what I mentioned earlier about the septate, you could usually visualize it in this kind of view, axial view you could see here clearly at the anterior aspect of vertebral body. This is the vertebral body and spinal canal. Anterior to it and underneath the ALL, which is this one, you could see a septated uh, pus collection. And this needs to be decompressed if troublesome. Now the abscess usually extend through a subligamentous type of extension and it may even breach the epidural space. And large abscess are usually not common in pyogenic type of infection and therefore can help us determine what type of abscess is this. Because usually the abscess in the spine tuberculosis is very big and it could reach a very high volume. Now for the MRI with contrast, it usually also helps you show a end plate disruption with high signal disc and the spinal cord may reveal findings of edema, myelomalacia, atrophy or even formation of any syringe. Now for the CT scan, you usually use it to determine any bony changes and the pattern of the destruction which could be fragmentary, osteolytic, subperiosteal or even sclerotic. Nuclear med medicine has a high sensitivity to detect infection especially in the early age. Now the lab laboratory findings is what makes it interesting because even though the spine tuberculosis can be indeed be detected through lab means, a lot of the test is frequently unreliable. Now complete blood count and also er erythrocyte sedimentation rate may only reveal some changes such as relative lymphocytosis or low hemoglobin due to the chronic infection. Now for the Mantuk test, uh, which is now seldom done because of its low accuracy, it does not measure the immunity 
to the tuberculosis rather it measure the degree of hypersensitivity to the tuberculin toxin now what we do here we use a purified protein derivative of the uh, tuberculin itself it has uh, we do a five unit tuberculin injection through the intradermal region and at around 48 to 72 hours we notice if there is any induration which should be uh, should be evaluated through palpation and also measured visually you could see here that there are various parameters that tells you whether this measurement is considered positive or not and in uh, cases where even a five millimeter reaction would be considered positive is if it is found in patients with hiv positive uh, person or persons with high recent contacts with active tb case now uh, it goes on and on uh, until it reaches a even higher uh, level of measurement which is 15 millimeter or more and it is usually considered positive when it is found in person with no known risk factors for tuberculosis any reactions larger than 15 millimeter are unlikely due to the previous bcg vaccination but beware of the false positive and false negative which could be seen in this test the false positive result uh, the cause may be uh, various it could be infection with other non-tuberculous mycobacteria uh, it could be caused by free previous bcg vaccination or incorrect method of the tuberculin administration it could also be caused by incorrect interpretation of the reaction now for the false negative it could be caused by even more causes such as cutaneous energy or the inability of our skin to react to any skin test because our weak immune system it could also be caused by recent tb infection or even very old tb infection now after knowing it we need to know that if after the injection is being performed we could we found that there is formation of vesicles, bullae, or even necrosis over the test site. This means that our body has a high tuberculin sensitivity and which means translates into a positive infection with tubercle bacilli. And next would be the CT guided biopsy with culture. Now, you usually do this uh, to obtain a sample for the culture and be because the sample takes so long, it could take up to 10 weeks to grow you usually could use other types of examination such as the PCR uh, other examination would include using a smear test which should, could be positive in 52% or even you could use a staining other method that is currently used is the gene expert method in which you could identify a part of the antigen of the uh, tuberculosis mycobacterium itself and then uh, replicate it and then identify it to see if it is a normal strain or even a drug resistant strain now this is a uh, scan that shows us the uh, hematoxylin and eosin stained tissue of the pathologic specimen which is removed during surgery and this is the immunohistochemical stain giving you this color specific color here and it is directed against the tuberculous antigen and is brown in the pathologic specimen as shown here now this brown staining shows us that there is indeed a present uh, uh, presence of a tuberculosis antigen now next would be the treatment plan now for the management plan itself usually it is uh, managed non-operatively for the mild cases and operative only in certain cases of emergency when you're facing exams you need to study uh, completely uh, regarding this management plan and one of the good study guide that you could use is the total treatment algorithm that is when uh, that is in the book uh, by professor broto in indonesia you could see here that there are uh, a total of several alternatives of treatment for the uh, spine tuberculosis ranging from non-operative to non-operative treatment method now i'm going to discuss it with my usual pattern which is the non-operative and 
operative treatment method. The non-operative treatment method is indicated when you find no neurologic deficit and it remains as a mainstay of treatment. What you usually do here is you provide chemotherapy with or without application of spine orthosis to help the pain control and prevent the deformity. But beware of the uh, side effects of using spinal orthosis because when you use this type of orthosis, generally your muscles functions are being taken over by the orthosis and therefore the prolonged use is definitely not recommended because it could lead to the back muscle atrophy. Now what you usually give is these four drugs which are the rifampicin, isoniazide, pyrazinamide and ethambutol which is given for two months followed by the administration of rifampicin and isoniazide for around uh, seven months. A total of nine months is indeed uh, recommended but it could be prolonged based on the condition of your patient and the results of the follow-up uh, culture specimen uh, results. Now these drugs, these are the four types of drugs, isoniazid, rifampicin, paracetamol, and thambutol and these are the dose in milligrams per kilogram for your daily dose uh, with a maximum dose and these are the dosage given in three times of drug administration per week. Now each of these uh, drug regimen also carries a side effects that needs to be that one needs to be aware of. For the first uh, drugs, which is the pyrazamine and ethambutol, they could give you a various side effects such as gastrointestinal type of uh, the pyrazamine especially could uh, result in a gastrointestinal type of disturbances and also liver disturbances. For the ethambutol, it could even cause color blindness or any visual disturbances. For the other drugs that are uh, not frequently used, it usually give you all those uh, side effects that you usually found such as the gastrointestinal disturbances and also liver disturbances. And therefore, monitoring of the liver function is crucial when you are administrating these type of drugs. The operative treatment method itself is usually indicated when you found, sorry, Okay, when you found a neurologic deficit, uh, especially in cases of acute severe paraplegia, but also you could you do it in cases where there is advanced cassation, fibrosis, and avascularity, because these factors may limit the antibiotics' ability to penetrate and cure and cleanse those germs inside your body. And one of the indications includes spine instability and progressive kyphosis. Now for the operative treatment method, there are various surgical techniques that could be done, which includes the Hong Kong procedure, the halo traction anterior decompression, and also bone grafting and plating. These are usually reserved for the cervical problems. And you could also do osteotomy if you find a severe kyphosis that needs correction. Now for the Hong Kong procedure, this is our these are the current accepted treatment plan and the technique include radical anterior debridement but, and, but also you need to do a fusion surgery and you use uninstrumented autogenous strut graft to help fuse the vertebrae from vertebra one vertebrae body to the other. The advantages of using this kind of technique is that it allows earlier healing and less sinus formation. And besides, because you do not use any implant, then definitely no foreign body in there. Now, more on spine tuberculosis, you need to know the various complications which may arise and it include the spread of abscess along the retropharyngeal region but it could also develop into a arthritis of the tb and also formation of pseudoaneurysm pots formation uh, pots paraplegia and also sinus deformation sinus formation the deformity which may occur is the kyphotic deformity over at the back region also known as the gibbous deformity now while you are now uh, well aware of what spine tuberculosis is, you sometimes need to identify that there are some subtypes of spinal tuberculosis that is known as the atypical type of spinal tuberculosis, in which there is usually no visible lesion and associated with cervical myelopathy. What happens here is actually there is a formation of intraspinal granuloma 
and the lesion itself it involves neural arch involvement therefore causing a compressive myelopathy where as you might recall earlier that in the spinal tuberculosis as discussed in my first part of the video it usually involves the anterior part of the vertebrae instead of the posterior part now the treatment plan is generally the same but operative treatment is more commonly done here because of the compressive myelopathy that is happening so you need to do some sort of laminectomy to make clear the whole subdural granuloma that has formed or even the compression surgery of the spinal cord along with uh, to clear up all those intramedullary granuloma which is causing the myelopathy itself now i guess that is all for today's discussion regarding the spine tuberculosis be sure to look at the first part of the video first to get a better grip of these basics and also the classification scheme before you move on to this video thank you and please subscribe to the orthopedic tutor channel for more videos